All right. <coughs> so most of what we'll be talking to today is going to be labeled. If there is anything off label that I'll be discussing, I will let you guys know. Uh, most of the numbers, all the guidelines, they're all taken straight out of the American Heart Association and Stroke Association guidelines. We'll talk about some of the latest trials and what is happening in the world of stroke that is latest. Uh, the talks, like I said, is going to be in two parts. Uh, the emergency room talk and also the inpatient talk. Mainly what we do in the emergency room is to decide whether the patient needs TPA or not, whether the patient needs to go for a mechanical thrombectomy or endovascular intervention. Um, and what do we do with the blood pressure, the glucose, and the other nuances. Once the patient comes to the inpatient, though, our priorities change. The acute stuff has already been taken care of. We're trying to figure out why the stroke happened what we can do to make sure it doesn't happen again, and how do we work up these patients. Um, as you all know, stroke uh, has a very huge burden. I think uh, the cost for taking care of stroke is in the, is, I think around this year it was two billion. Um, the, it just keeps going up because more and more strokes happen. We have a stroke every four minutes. Um, and these are old numbers. I'm sure they've gone up since then. Uh, we, in my day, I have, in, on an average day, I see 10 strokes a day at least. That, that's 10 new strokes every day. Um, one of the things that we tell our patients as a warning sign, or it is an easy way to identify strokes, and this we counsel all our patients who we take care of, is called a FAST. Um, it's an easy way to remember things. Droopy face, any arm weakness, any slurred speech, you call 911. Okay, so that's kind of how we educate them. So the first new thing that's going on is you see here an ambulance with a CAT scan in it. Okay, so what's happening is we're actually bringing the CAT scans into the ambulance, and we're going to be starting this. This is already there in Cleveland, and it's there in UT. The University of Texas has it. What they do is anytime somebody calls in for a possible stroke, this ambulance goes, gets them. Even before they reach the hospital, the neurologist has seen the scan. They're already talking to the patient while they're in the ambulance, and the EMS guys are going to give TPA. Okay, This is kind of the future, because it takes a long time for people to get to the hospital, not in Philadelphia. Every block has a hospital. But <laughs> when you're in a rural area, it, it takes a long time. We've had patients flown to our medical centers, and it takes about an hour sometimes. And it, that's precious time you're wasting. So this, I think, will make a huge difference. Coming to hmm? is that a real picture? it is a real picture. Yeah, this is I think the ambulance from Cleveland Clinic. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 uh, uh, there are only two doing it right now. Uh, Cleveland Clinic and like I said, <clears throat> UT Southwestern. They're like the big ones. Um, hopefully, more people will be getting it soon. Coming to the diagnosis of stroke. Um, the one thing I teach all my residents and uh, all the medical students who rotate with us is acuity is key. Okay, Many things can look like stroke. Um, I've detailed some of the things here, like migraine with aura, syncope. All these things can look like stroke. But kind of the story that you get is an acute onset. Or even if it's stuttering symptoms, it's acute. Like one second you're fine, the next second you're not. That should always make you think of a vascular event of some sort. Okay. Uh, TIAs almost never last beyond an hour. So if someone tells you that they're numb on one side of their body for two days and you don't find anything, it's less likely to be a stroke. Okay, It's pretty rare. You might see it, but it's very unusual. Uh, the one stroke mimic I want to bring to all of your attention is migraine with aura. Uh, auras almost never last beyond an hour. Okay, And the auras are almost always the same. I have never diagnosed complex migraine in my career in six years. I've never made the diagnosis. You almost never see complex migraine. Yet you see all these patients who carry the diagnosis. It's probably not complex migraine. It's very strong hereditary. It, there's a lot of like family members with the same thing. And it's always the same thing that keeps happening. It shouldn't be different things happening at different times that should call into question this diagnosis. OK, so you're in the emergency room. The patient hasn't had a scan yet, and you want to localize the stroke. OK, these are some simple tricks to say approximately where the stroke is. And since we have MRIs, you find out that you're right or wrong. But most of the time, you will be right. 
if you see someone who comes in drowsy, it's usually a stroke in the brainstem or a big stroke in the middle cerebral artery. These are the only two conditions that cause drowsiness with weakness. Okay, there's not much else that can do this. Um, if you see gaze deviation, like, you, know, you open the person's eyes and they're off to one side and they, they have language disturbances or they have neglect or they have a visual field cut, it's always, almost always going to be a cortical stroke. It's very unlikely to be a subcortical or a brainstem stroke. If the patient's very awake, they have none of these things, they only have weakness or sensory loss, it's going to be a lacunar stroke most likely the thalamus, internal capsule, or subcortical area. Uh, brainstem is very special. The way to tell that someone has a brainstem stroke clinically is they'll have some cranial nerve palsy on one side, and they'll have weakness on the opposite side. If you ever see that, it's brainstem. No other area in the brain can do that. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on anatomy and all that. I don't want to put you guys to sleep, but um, know the circle of villus. The reason we like to know the circle of villus is uh, uh, it, it, it's an important source of collaterals. Like one artery gets blocked off, it's your circle of villus that's trying to save the brain. That's why we do all the things we do. We're trying to save as much brain as possible. This area called penumbra, which we'll get to in a little bit. And you do that through the circle of villus by encouraging flow through the, you know, it's like a highway with bypasses. You know, one area gets blocked, you have the high bypass, and you can still get the blood to the brain. OK, we'll talk a little bit about the, so throughout this talk, I'm going to say MCA, PCA, and ACA. So I just want you guys to know what, what I'm talking about. MCA is, and you can see that MCA, middle cerebral, PCA, and ACA are the posterior and anterior cerebral. When I say large vessel strokes, or when we like send patients who've had a large vessel stroke, this is what basically we're talking about. You can see the distribution here. Um, the one in pink is the ACA, the one in violet is the MCA, and the one in white is the PCA. MCA strokes, these, these are the most common large vessel strokes we see. We're all used to them. Patient comes in with hemiparesis, patient comes in with sensory loss, patient comes in with a gaze deviation. If it's the dominant hemisphere, they'll come in with language disturbances. If it's the non-dominant hemisphere, they come with neglect. Okay. And almost always, they'll have altered mental status. That's why when I see someone in the ED who has hemiparesis but is completely awake and giving their history, I'm less likely to worry about an MCA stroke. But if they're drowsy, their eyes are like two off to one side, and you're like, if they're not able to tell you what's going on, that's when you worry about an MCA. ACAs are much less common. The reason they're much less common is because of the circle of Willis. Okay, you can see that there's a communicating artery between both the ACAs. So even if you block off one ACA, the blood flows to the other ACA and the ACOM, and then it just makes its way up to the brain territory. So you don't usually get strokes in this area. Uh, some unfortunate patients have only one ACA. They have no ACOMs. Those are the people who come to us with a stroke. The thing about ACA is um, it can look very strange. Okay, These patients almost always go to psych or go to medicine for altered <coughs> mental status. And then two days later, someone gets a scan of the head, and they find a stroke, and then they call us. Okay, Because the frontal lobe is all behavioral. Okay, They will be acting strange. They, will be, they, look, they might look depressed. Uh, they'll be peeing on themselves here. And people, family members are like, he's been acting strange. That's all they're going to say. Sometimes you might have leg weakness, which goes a lot with ACA strokes. You don't have arm or face weakness. You just have a little leg weakness. So be mindful of these kinds of strokes. <coughs> uh, PCA, um, again, PCA, people will not tell you that they have a visual field cut. Unfortunately, patients don't make it that easy for you. What happens is they will be in a road traffic accident. They'll bump into things on their left side. They'll have a, all these injuries on one side of their body. Uh, that usually calls to our attention that there is something going on in one visual field. Okay, so usually with a PCA stroke, you have a opposite side homonymous hemianopia. Um, you don't usually have arm and leg weakness, but PCA also supplies the thalamus. So sometimes you can get arm and leg weakness. Pretty unusual. Okay, so your patients in them, we get a patient into the emergency room. Uh, the most important team in the emergency room is time is brain. But every minute, minute you wait, um, you lose around two billion neurons for every minute. 
Okay, and uh, you can see this graph. This is a graph from all the TPA trials. They, they looked at all the TPA trials. They looked at the time that the patient got TPA from symptom onset. There was one thing that popped up. The sooner you got TPA, the better you did. Across all studies, even the studies that were looked at after this trials, the same holds true. So it doesn't matter to me whether the patient symptoms started only 15 minutes ago or one year ago. One, I mean, not one year, I'm sorry. One month ago. I'm sorry, no. One hour ago. Um, it shouldn't matter to you, okay? So when somebody is in the window for TPA, you move as fast as you can. You try to get the TPA. Our average time for giving someone TPA is 30 to 40 minutes. The national average is 16 minutes. And we didn't get there. It took us a lot of work, but we got there. Okay? Uh, some of the other things you want to do is you want to do your ABCs as soon as the patient comes in. Like I said, sometimes MCA, brainstem strokes, they need to be intubated. They cannot protect their airway. So you let the emergency room folks do what they need to do, then you take over. You want to lay them flat so as to improve perfusion to the brain. Um, they always get a finger stick just to see how the sugar is because hypoglycemia can masquerade as a stroke. Sometimes giving D50 improves all their symptoms, you know, easy fix. Um, you also get a blood pressure because we'll talk about how, because we want different goals based on what you're going to do for these patients. Um, you try to get them to CT as soon as possible. We actually examine our patients while they're going on this to the scan on a stretcher, on a moving gurney. We're just examining at the side. Okay. Um, as a neurologist, we get three key pieces of information. We, we don't want a lot. I mean, we're not trying to take a detailed history at this point. We just want to decide on TPA or no TPA. The first thing you want to know is last seen normal. What does that mean? It doesn't mean the time that your family found the patient or all these things. It, it means the time that somebody last saw you and spoke to you and you were completely normal. This is very important. Um, it, it, things can get twisted out and sometimes you end up giving TPA to people whose symptoms started two days ago. Okay, that is not good. They'll say, if you ask them, they'll say, oh, you know, two days ago I had this numbness and then it went away and last night it came back and it went away and then I went to sleep and then I woke up with weakness. That is not the patient you want as GPA. Okay, so you have to be very, very careful with this. Um, the other thing we always look at is the NIH stroke scale. It's a way of communicating between physicians. It tells you how bad the stroke is. We'll look at it in a minute. Okay, and then you can follow it. Like once the patient leaves, what was their NIH stroke scale? Once they get to rehab and or out of rehab, what was their NIH? And once they come to clinic, so it gives you an idea of how the patient's doing, whether they're getting better or worse, or they're just the same. Um, we also asked for a few contraindications for TPA, which we'll look at. So you get your patient to CT. What can the CTs look like? So they can look vastly different. Okay, on the left side, the one with the red arrow, you see a, a clot in the middle cerebral artery. This is a non-contrast CT, no contrast, nothing. Okay, if you see this and you see that the brain everywhere else looks fine, this patient's going to get TP and he's probably going to go to endovascular. Okay, on the right, you see a completed MCA stroke. Even though the family says the symptom started only two hours ago, it's probably not true because changes on the CATs can take up to six to eight hours to appear. Okay, so if you see something like this, you're not going to TPA the patient. And obviously at the bottom, you see a hemorrhage. A hemorrhage is absolute contraindication. We do not TPA those patients. So always people get a CAT scan as soon as they hit the emergency room for this reason. It gives you an idea if there are already changes because if there are already changes of stroke and there are significant changes, you give TPA, they're more likely to bleed. Also, you want to rule out a hemorrhage. So the NIH stroke scale has 14 components. Uh, everybody who comes into neuro gets this little booklet um, that has all these pictures and all the sentences and the words that I've detailed here. Um, so we, we go through each component in a systematic manner, and then we document the NIH stroke scale. TPA is indicated if your NIH is more than four. We're actually looking at patients less than four as part of a trial which we are enrolled in. Um, so the figure at the top is what we use on the left. You know, the one in the kitchen is what we use for visual field deficits. And it's also what we use for neglect. People with neglect will only tell one half of the story. They won't see the other half of the room in this picture. Um, we use the objects on the right for naming. And then below that, we use the sentences for repetition. And then below that, the words we use for disarthry. Yeah. Speakers, is there equivalence for them? Uh, so I usually use an interpreter and you improvise. 
so what i usually do is instead of these i tell them these words i tell them any any words or i just uh, tell them ask the family like do you think his speech is slurred if they say it's slurred i'll take their word for it um as far as objects go if some people don't know what a hammock is i mean i i'm not surprised like so i usually show them my watch and then for a less common object i show them my stethoscope so you want when you're testing anomia we test two things common objects which are usually preserved even with subtle anomia and then rare objects you know like something like a stethoscope or something less common commonly that people say so we usually you sometimes you have to improvise but yeah um but as far as sentences go i tell them to say some like i tell the family to say some phrase and just repeat it back that's that's <clears throat> that's pretty much it um the other components are pretty they just you just have to be able to follow instructions that doesn't happen too often so yeah um okay so tpa is approved by the fda for only up to 3 hours this is very important when we give tpa between the 3 to 4 and 1/2 hour windows we tell our patients that it is not fda approved okay there is good evidence the american heart association and stroke association consider it standard of care we will give it but you know you, you just want your patients to know that it's not fda approved it's just something that we as a team <coughs> made it a policy at our institution um the trial that got tp approved was the nins trial and uh, we'll talk about it in a minute and the trial that got tp approved after the 3 hour window is the ecas3 trial before we dwell into the trials i just want to bring up the modified rankin i don't know do you guys use the modified rankin uh, when you see strokes and in rehab no okay so um this is something we use a lot okay because um why are we doing all this because you want people to be independent once you're done with them you don't want to be want them to be vegetables that's worse than you know not surviving this stroke so the way we look at trials is are they independent or are they not independent so this is a scale that we use commonly to do that the one mark the marking in red from 0 to 2 people are usually independent two they give up some activities but they're still doing everything on their own all the interventions you want to do tpa endovascular this is what you're shooting for you want 0 to 2 okay that's why we'll look at that that part in the trials rather than everything else okay so the nin the nin trial actually compared tpa to placebo so tpa is not a magic bullet most people think that once you give tpa the clot's going to nicely open up and the patient's going to do fine that's far from the truth uh this trial actually proved that So the first part of the trial, they enrolled a few patients, and they said, "We're going to give TPA. We're going to see an immediate change, and then we'll get it approved." Unfortunately, they didn't see any immediate changes. So then they said, "Okay, let's see what happens three months out." Um, so when they did enroll more patients and they finished the trial, they found that you're thirty percent more likely to do better at three months. So again, this is something I tell my patients. I tell them whether it's FDA approved or not, and I tell them that, you know. only in 15 to 20% of cases your clot's going to immediately open up okay most of the in the rest of the 80% of cases especially if you have a big clot or a big stroke it's not likely to open up your clot okay um but 30% improvement and this is independent patients patients who wouldn't have been independent they became independent because of tpa that's 30% more likely i would so it's a pretty good treatment um the bleeding risk is 6% this is when initially tpa came out we we were still weren't clear on who who not to give it to so it's much lower now um ecas3 like i said was a trial that got tpa approved beyond the 3 hour window again 28% improvement and chance of being in more independent than compared to people who didn't get tpa um in this trial ich was lower it was less than 3% so when do we not give tpa um so there was a recent fda label change they took out like 80% of all the contraindications because people just weren't giving enough tpa uh, uncontrolled hypertension was one people were like we can't give tpa because the blood pressure is too high that's crazy this day and age with all the medications we have that almost never happens i'll i'll rephrase it that never happens okay it's not almost um So, if somebody has taken one of the novel agents and for atrial fibrillation, you are hearing about all these new agents: apixaban, rivaroxaban, and prodaxa. Uh, we have no way of measuring whether it's in the system or not. So, if somebody says that 
you know we they took these in the for past 48 hours you cannot tpa them okay um inr more than 1.7 used to be a contraindication for people on coumadin that's been taken out um but still you know as we still haven't changed our policy because we still find that there's more bleeding if you give it with higher inr so i it's up for it's still up for debate um active bleeding in the brain or internally is you know kind of self explanatory you don't want to give tpa uh, recent brain or spine surgery because they tend to bleed a lot <clears throat> um any neo like brain tumors and this doesn't include benign brain tumors like meningiomas and all that like malignant ones like gbm and all these things we don't want to give tp um uncontrolled hypertension has been removed but we usually control it before we give it now the important thing to understand is even if you cannot give these people tpa you can still take them to endovascular therapy which we'll talk about past three or four months yeah the, the package insert has been changed everything's been changed um yeah i think it's about yeah three months so the tpa contraindications are a little different if you're beyond the three hour window again the beyond the three hour window is, is just a little strange we take a written consent for it because it's not fda and uh, these are some of the contraindications. Any history of both stroke and diabetes, age more than 80 or NI more than 25, a big stroke or any anticoagulation, irrespective of the INR. Um, since the trial came out, we have given, you know, the ones I marked in red, we have given people TP on a case-by-case -case basis after explaining to the family that this is completely off-label. They've done very well. Um, stroke is highly individualized care. So, it, each patient that we decide on TPA, we look at them on a very case-by-case -case basis. If you have an 80-year-old who plays tennis and does his own financials, uh, doesn't have a lot of comorbidities, I, I would give them. I would definitely, even if they had a prior stroke and diabetes, you still end up giving it to them. So it depends on all these things, how functional they are, what's going on, how many comorbidities do they have, whether they're well-controlled, and how does their scan look like. Um, so you got your CT before TPA. You want to make sure that the onset was within four and a half hours. You want to do the NIH stroke scale. Um, so the blood pressure, we like it. And this is what the AHA also says, at least below 185 by 110. It's a made up, it's a completely made up number. Okay. I tried to find out where this number came from. It's just the first trial that looked at TPA that kind of said, sat down and said, okay, let's pick a number. This is what they picked. And this is what we are going by as of now. And people seem to do well. Okay, so it hasn't been changed for that reason. Um, we will start TPA, but if somebody's sugar is 400 or 500 or they're in DK, usually we end up putting them on an insulin drip. You want your sugars below 200. Um, nothing is worse for bleeding after like TPA than sugar. Okay, out of all the risk factors, high sugars and high blood pressure is your number one risk factor for bleeding after TPA. Uh, we don't wait for labs anymore. The nurses draw the labs, but we don't wait for them. The only time you wait for labs is, like I said, if the, if somebody's on Coumadin, you have to wait for the labs. But otherwise, we're giving TPA. You don't need a consent. You just tell the patient, we're going to give you a clot-busting medication. These are the benefits. These are the risks. And I'll show you a little card that I carry with me that I showed to the patient. You're giving TPA. If there's no family, we don't wait around to find family. This is life-saving treatment, so we'll just give it. Uh, the dose is 0.9 mix per keg. You split it into a bolus and an infusion. <coughs> um, one of the things that TPA does that nobody knows about, everybody knows about bleeding, right? But TPA can cause angioedema, okay? We see one every two, three months, and it's very strange, okay? This, on the side that you're paralyzed, that's the side that your tongue swells, that's the side that you, like, airway gets narrow. It's just one half of your body gets swollen. Um, you have to be very careful about this because we've had to do tricks and we've had to intubate these patients sometimes. But most of the time, if you're watching closely, they do fine with all the treatments, steroids, Benadryl. Um, once you give TPA, your blood pressure checks and neuro checks are more frequent. Um, there's a power plan for all this, so we just put in the power plan and then we're done. So what's different after TPA? You do not want your blood pressure going up. Like I said, that's pretty bad. Always want to give. We always get a repeat scan 24 hours later to look for bleeding, and some predictors like we talked about are old age, um, a bad stroke, 
or a big stroke and the clot that i showed you guys in earlier on the cat scan um if somebody comes in very late um high blood pressure high sugar and you know they're already demented they already had a poor functional status to begin with. um if somebody bleeds during tpa we give cryo and we give tranexamic acid so many people don't understand when i say bleeding risk is 6% and 3% they're like huh and then i say 30% of they just can't process the number so i just show them this card i tell them that if you get tpa you know your chances of that's your chance of being in the green which means you've benefited white is neutral it means nothing happened and then the chance of you having some bad outcome is that the people in red they look at the odds and they say yeah sure okay so it's it's a useful way to show explain to patient so unfortunately uh just when you think you can go back to watching your you know uh, binge watching on breaking bad on your night float uh you can't because there's more to do for these patients <laughs> which brings me to endovascular therapy which is the hot topic in stroke this year um people have been going back and forth and saying you know tpa sucks you know, 15% of patients immediately get better i i don't want to wait 3 months i mean i don't see most of my patients 3 months out i'm seeing them in the hospital i've given tpa i come back the next day they're still the same i'm like okay 3 months later it's fine but i want to see immediate change i don't want to see this huge stroke on the cat scan i want to see something better so they said you know let's just go in there and fish the clot out um the light right now the latest devices that we use are the stent retriever devices or the stable that's the one here what it does is it goes into the clot it expands actually you can just deploy the stent and then you just pull the clot out you can give intra arterial tpa as well um all the trials that came out a few years ago were you know like there was no added benefit but there were seven trials that came out this year that showed hands down endovascular therapy works important thing is it's only for big clots if you have a tiny lacunar stroke your nih is 5 or 6 and there's nothing to fish out there's no clot there so you can you we don't to take those cases to endovascular uh, we do take uh, people who in whom you can't give tpa somebody like last week i had somebody who had a splenic laceration who was in trauma service and suddenly had a dissection and a big thrombus went to endovascular is doing perfectly fine now um we do take people who are out of window this this can be done up to 6 to 8 hours if there's an mca stroke and if there's a basilar artery clot the one in blue that i've marked out you can do it up to 24 hours because most of these patients who get a basilar thrombosis get locked up okay um, the other alternative is to like fish the clot out and take a chance with a bleed and most patients i can tell you right now they will say take the clot out okay and the earlier you do it the better the patients do So the trial that got uh, endovascular therapy approved and is now standard of care is called the Mr. Clean trial. I don't know how they come up with these names. I have to. Uh, I, I think there must be some software for this, or they put these names and all these letters in. Okay, so the Mr. Clean trial again. I'll make this short and sweet. Um, it compared TPA, which is now standard of care, to TPA with thrombectomy. You do not. Most of the time, if the patient's in window, we don't do either one. We do both. <coughs> um there was a 13 like 13.5% ch greater chance of being independent in the interventional group um your nih was lowered by 3 points i mean if it's for weakness of the hand you know instead of your hand being flaccid now you can use it yeah, sure okay uh there was no difference in adverse effects no increased bleeding no increased problems from the procedure itself yeah So along with Mr Clean I think there were seven other trials I, I mentioned only four of them here which are the big ones all of them were stopped after Mr Clean was done because they said you know why are we doing the same trial over again it's already shown so much benefit um on the x axis you're going to see the time it took them to get them to the interventional suite which is what we are finding out is pretty bad right now so we are trying to reduce our numbers it takes a long time to get somebody to the suite but the sooner you get them in there and this is time is brain right the sooner you get them into the suite the better they do the other thing you see is we were talking about you know blood flow into this big artery right so the one in da the darkest color shows you the chances that you know your clot has been removed and you can see all across the board in all the interventional interventional trials it was much higher than people who just received tpa which is shown in the white bars 
Okay. The one in gray shows you how many people became independent compared to just TPA. That again, you can see the difference between just TPA, which is in white, and uh, people who became independent with TPA and intervention, which is in gray. It's huge. So why do we do all this? So I already said brain cells start dying within 15, 15 to 25 minutes is when brain starts dying. So by the time most people reach the hospital, they already have what is called a core of the infarct, which is dead tissue. Can't do anything about it. But the main problem is they have all these symptoms, but their scan looks fine because they have a huge penumbra. When I say penumbra, I mean this area that has a restricted blood flow and it's just limping along. The neurons are in shock. They're not working, but they're not dead yet. They're in, an, they're in anaerobic metabolism. They're just somehow getting along. If you can save this area, patients do much better. That's the whole point of intervention. So uh, next question is, I've started my, I've seen this uh, CAT scan. You know, sometimes you see a clot on the CAT scan, like the one I showed you before, the one at the bottom. You get lucky and you're like, yeah, let's take the patient to the angio suite and take out the clot. Sometimes you don't know. Uh, NIH cannot be used. Maybe sometimes it can be used. So we need some form of imaging before we take patients to an endovascular suite. This is usually done with an angiogram. Depending on the center, we, we like to do CT angiograms. Some centers like to do MR angiograms. You take your pick. Both are equally sensitive. What are you looking for? A big clot. Okay. You can see the arrows here. They point to a sudden cutoff of the MC. There's a clot there. There's nothing flowing beyond. This is the patient you'll take to an endovascular suite. So we talked about penumbra, but people keep asking, I don't believe you. There's no penumbra there. <laughs> so uh, there is a way to show penumbra. And this is also something we do. Along with our CT angio, we do a CT perfusion. Okay, uh, This is what a CT perfusion looks like. Um, so the areas that are marked in green and red, the area in red is actually the core of the infarction. Okay, That's the area that's dead and done. But the whole area in green, that's the penumbra. That's all the area that the patient won't lose if you intrude. <clears throat> and this is an MR perfusion. We don't use this, but other centers do. And it's the same thing. The software lets you, they, when they give you the report, they actually color code this and give it to you. They make it really easy for you. Because it's 3 AM in the morning, and you're like, I, I don't know. Just, just tell me the report. And just. Is, uh... Einstein, is it neurology or surgery or IR. IR. Yeah, IR does that. So usually what happens is after we give GPA, we'll look at the patient. You know, if all obviously we talked about cortical features, right? If they have aphasia, if they have all these things, or even if they don't, I take most of my patients to a CT angio and a CT perfusion. Um, if there's a big clot, we call IR, they come in, they fish out the clot. Um, blood pressure management. So we talked about TPA. We talked about endovascular trials. And when we take patients to endovascular, the next thing is what do you do with the blood pressure? It depends. If you don't give any if someone TPA, you know, the stroke's already finished, you know, they're out of window, they're not interventional candidates, there's no big clot. Um, usually we leave the blood pressure at 220 or 120. You do not, this is called permissive hypertension. First few, what, 18 to 24 hours after stroke? You let them go as high as possible. Sometimes we'll actually bring it up because through the circle of willis, through the collaterals that the brain has, you're trying to encourage perfusion to the area that's to the penumbra. That's that's what you're trying to save by doing this. Um, if somebody gets TPA before TPA, like we said, you at least want the blood pressure below 185 by 110. And after they just said, okay, we'll reduce it by five. So they made it 180 by 105. Again, these are totally made up numbers. You will not hear other people say this, but there is there is no evidence for this. You, you can ask another stroke neurologist, they'll say, oh, I like my numbers at 170. But the common theme is you do not want to drop blood pressures. Okay. The only exception where you'll bring down someone's blood pressure after an acute stroke is if you remove the clot. Makes sense, right? There's no clot, there's no obstruction, blood flow is back. So you do not want to keep the blood pressure high. So that's the only place where you'll normalize them. You'll bring them to 140 by 90 or below. Okay. Otherwise, you let the blood pressure ride high. That's the common theme. Um, these are the two common agents we use. We give some labetalol. It lasts for 15 minutes. And then you, if it's not working, we usually start nicardipine. They're very good. I've never had to go beyond that. Um, 
but if you have to um oh okay i'm sorry these are the agents we'd never want to use we hate these medications okay that's why i put them on this list here if somebody comes in for hypertensive urgency medicine grabs these agents and they use them for like you know like water but they're pretty bad for the brain so good agents bad agents okay uh they raise the intracranial pressure um what they do is they cause vasodil this, these are all like basically vasodilators um what happens is when you the brain is a fixed space so there's blood csf and brain uh, if you have an mca <coughs> stroke or if you have a big stroke you're already short on space because your brain's expanding so there's no room for anything else you give them nitro or sodium nitroprusside suddenly these vessels dilate and there's like increased pressure in the brain they can herniate so especially with big strokes you never use these agents if i see somebody on hydrolysis even after they've had a stroke and they're in my clinic i hate it okay because it lasts for a few hours you have to take it three times a day when was the last time you saw somebody take a medication three times a day uh, heck i wouldn't take a medication three times a day and i'm a doctor so uh, so these these are pretty bad even in the acute phase but afterwards also if somebody has a tiny stroke and they have some pulmonary edema fine you know let it slide give nitroglycerin but otherwise no for patients that we want to get on our stroke floors I think what uh, Peter was getting at is that a lot of times hydrolysis is used. Yeah. We don't do I we don't do a lot of IVs. What do you want in the uh, after we want to get them three or four days after they present to you? What do you prefer that they you know on for if we remove the cause and it's not pain, if it is a blood pressure increase as a temporizing measure to adjustment therapy, what do you prefer? So um, once the acute phase of stroke is over, and we'll look at all the agents, um, we usually like diuretics, calcium channel blockers. Like acute oh, acute spike in blood pressure. I mean, people have acute spikes in blood pressure. It's, it's, it's fine. But before it's okay. adjustment, somebody goes up. A lot of times, so. You know, Ew. <laughs> I know that's 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 the appropriate so, so no no exactly so the reaction you should have is okay so clon what is the problem with all these medications okay clonidine um, it has rebound hypertension so your patients fine when they're in the hospital and then they leave the hospital they miss a day of clonidine their blood pressure shoots up to 180 to 190 that's not something so I think about a case that the on-call person is getting 3 a.m. call and this person's blood pressure okay. is 200 and 100. What as an oral agent? So as an oral, so what I usually do is if they're out of the acute stroke, I just adjust oral medications. So there are a few ways to get around this problem. Um, the one that acts the fastest and I like a lot personally is nifedipine. Okay. Um, you know, you want to make sure the patient has insurance and all that because we get patients without insurance all the time. But what I do is, um, most of the time, the reason that blood pressure shoots up in the night is because you're giving all the medications in the morning. The, the patient's on four blood pressure meds, but he gets them at 9 a.m. So his blood pressure is fine all through the day, and what happens is at night it's 200 or 100. Just a simple change in the regimen. You split two medications in the morning, two medications at night, they're much better. So I give a dose of their morning, like what are they supposed to get in the morning, and then I just, just change it the next day to like one in the morning, one in the evening. Easy fix. Or I, I will add medications and we'll talk about it a little bit. But after the acute phase, the only time I worry is intracranial hemorrhages. Because you know, in a hemorrhage, you really don't want their blood pressure all over the place, especially not high. But for an ischemic stroke, I mean, these people have been living with these blood pressures. It will take you a while to control them. In the acute phase, I understand. Within 24 to 48 hours, we are very aggressive. You give IV labetalol, or you know, like uh, we sometimes hang a nicardipine drip. But after the acute phase, this is real, especially if it's only a transient blood pressure blood pressure spike and it comes down on its own. Uh, I would just adjust oral medications. Okay, right. sorry, for the hemorrhagics, okay. I just give labetalol, especially if it's a transient spike and there was some reason for it. I just give them some labetalol IV. Okay. Um, you can give them amlodipine. Um, amlodipine can be given through pegs also. It's kind of nifedipine can't be given through a peg, but amlo can be, and it acts pretty fast. So we give amlodipine. Yep. The reason I'm saying these medications instead of the hydralazine and all these is 
blood pressure fluctuation is the worst thing for stroke and bleeds not the high blood pressure constantly not the low blood pressure more than anything else it's the ups and downs that makes them get worse so you know you want a medication that's smoother uh, and ace and arbs diuretics and calcium channel blockers are like the smoothest medications out there they they're very good they start acting almost within a few hours they work um what are some of the other things we do in an emergency room um like i said you want your sugars below 200 like all patients if if you can't get it down with uh, subcutaneous or iv insulin you just put them on an insulin drip okay um we always check for mi so okay people following tpa can get a like a huge myocardial infarction so if somebody is sweating or diaphoretic or hypotensive and they can't tell you what's going on always check for myocardial infarction with ekg and troponins what tpa does is it sometimes there's clots in the heart that break off and then you have an mi sometimes there's an ap left atrial appendix clot that breaks off we had a patient last year who just suddenly started sweating and was hypotensive so that's the only thing we thought he was bleeding first he wasn't bleeding anywhere and then when we did his ekg or like a st elevation mi so about 10% of all strokes will have an acute mi with it it's it's pretty common because the brain also controls your autonomic so when you have a big stroke especially in mca it drives your autonomics up your blood pressure goes up heart rate goes up if you have cad underlying you get a myocardial infarction from just the demand uh we also check for arrhythmias that's why they're always on a monitor uh, while they're in the hospital but that's just not enough so we'll see what we do to look for afib more okay so uh, Con in contrary to bleeds where you always want a neurosurgeon there even if most of the time they like uh, we won't do anything just just watch the patient good luck uh, mm. but for strokes <laughs> <laughs> no they they so most, i mean if they want if there's something to do they will do it. so there are two situations where you want to call the neurosurgeon emergently and even this can happen a few days out which is why you have to be mindful of this if somebody has a big mca stroke um day 3 or day 4 you know some some hospitals will discharge these patients early um they can suddenly start to swell okay and especially if they're young they have no room in their brain there's no atrophy anywhere so they suddenly become drowsy you know they they start throwing up they have these bad headaches it's usually called it's called a malignant mca it just looks like a tumor so like all this swelling and everything <laughs> uh, the treatment is a uh, hemicrany they just take off the skull cap let the brain expand and then the patients do much better we do not do this in old people <laughs> okay only below 60 because what we found was if you do it beyond 60 patients survive but they are usually vegetative cycle okay so we only do it if someone's young and it's uh, also you know with it's an mca the other place that you have to be very careful is cerebellar strokes okay they're tiny they look harmless and you know they're like cute little puppies and then suddenly they bite off your finger <laughs> okay so th this has happened to me a lot so usually i put these patients in the icu they're on watch for like a neurosurgical <laughs> intervention so you can see in this second slide that there is a cerebellar stroke on the left hemisphere this hypodensity right there mm -hmm. oh yeah this thing right there so what happens because of this so why the big deal so the posterior fossa is this space where the brain stem with the cerebellum everything is packed into this tiny little space and somewhere in this tiny little space is the fourth ventricle which is like a gutter for your csf all the csf goes through the fourth ventricle if that tiny space for some reason gets blocked you're screwed so you develop acute hydrocephalus like this guy so you can see that his ventricles you know look like balloons okay so this is acute hydrocephalus and this happens a lot and this doesn't happen immediately that's that's kind of the problem i i've seen this happen 7 days out or 8 days out with the patients already in rehab and suddenly for some reason god knows why they decide that they're going to have hydrocephalus so if you see cerebellar strokes and they're only a few days out be very careful about this you can have obstructive hydrocephalus the surgical intervention is usually they put in a drain to relieve the pressure and then sometimes they'll open the back of the skull up to relieve the pressure okay so we went through a lot 
I just want to put things in perspective. I'm not taking care of this acute stroke alone. There's a nurse with me. There's an ED room physician, and they all have their own roles, and they all do things. We all do things in parallel to try to get through this. When a patient comes in, my job is to decide. Okay, what is the NI stroke scale? When did the symptoms start? And am I giving TPA? Is there a contraindication? The ED doc is at the same time looking to see if the patient needs to be intubated. Is there anything else going on? Is the patient having an MI? Are they in shock or something else dramatic going on with the patient? Do they have a, Do they have a PE? You'll see all this stuff. And at the same time, the nurse is you know getting the blood pressure, sugar, labs, get two IV lines and a Foley in before TPA because people tend to bleed after that if you do anything. Uh, then I look at the CT and then I say, okay, you know, there's no findings of stroke or there are subtle changes, but there's nothing huge. We're going to give TPA. Uh, once the TPA is given, like I said, the next question we ask ourselves is, so patient need a neuro intervention because TPA doesn't open up all clocks. 15 person, that's pretty bad. Okay, even though patients tend to do much better three months down the road. So usually we get some form of imaging. CTA, CTP, or MR or MR perfusion. And then if the patient has a huge clot, we send them to intervention, we take out the clot. Um, again, if there's a bleed of, or if there's already finished stroke, obviously the treatment's supportive. We'll talk about that also. Okay. Any questions? Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. I got uh, some more blood pressure management questions because I, I get some kind of conflicting things sometimes after they leave the acute care of what our blood pressure goal you know, goals are long term, mm -hmm. um, both with just the you kind of run of the mill ischemic stroke, uh, also versus like somebody that has like the fibrobasilar stenosis. You know, mm -hmm. do you want to let them run a little bit higher? What kind of goal ranges are you looking at long term in those various? So, um, all the studies that looked at vertebrobasilar. They let the blood pressure run high for at least seven to eight days. Okay. Okay. Um, what we do, uh, and our part is after the first 24 to 48 hours, I try to normalize blood pressures and see what happens. Okay. Most patients tolerate it fine. Okay. Some very few, like maybe 10 to 15 percent, they just cannot tolerate low blood pressures. As soon as I bring them down, their symptoms come back, or their symptoms get worse. They have new strokes. Something happens. So in, that's the only time I'll send somebody to rehab and say, let his blood pressure run in the 160s or something. Okay. But otherwise, okay. so you try to bring after it after roughly a week, normal non-stroke patient blood pressure management goal. Yeah. And if they have no stenosis, like carotid stenosis or vertebrobasilar stenosis, there is no reason you should be keeping their blood pressures up. Yeah. Uh, when I see them in clinic, by that time, by hook or crook, I get them to normal. Okay. And... Uh, I've met, I think I have one or two patients in the practice that's like so many patients that I leave the blood pressure high because they have other things. They have autonomic dysfunction. They, they have some other problems as well. But otherwise, just the problem is if you let them run high for long, you're actually doing damage in the long run because all their problems happen because of uncontrolled hypertension in the first place. The constant barrage of high blood pressure on the blood vessels is what causes the atro and the stenosis. So we do it slowly in some cases. We try after 24 days. We try every day. Actually, in the morning when I round, I'm going to tell them, OK, let's bring the patient's blood pressure down, see what happens. And then if they can't stand it, I try the next day until they go to rehab. And then I say, OK, you know what? This guy doesn't handle low blood pressure, so I'll leave him high for a week, then slowly bring him down. And the other thing that happens is most of these patients are in bed when they're in the acute stroke unit. Once they get to rehab, there's stood up so they can have falls in blood pressure and all this so we, we are a little we take that into consideration as well before we send them okay you guys need